Hi, everyone. Welcome to this uh, latest ICHK panel discussion, during which we're going to talk about reading habits in teenagers, and we're going to offer some practical suggestions for how parents can support their children with reading, their teenage children with reading at home. Uh, my name is Sean McDermott. I'm the Deputy Head of School here at ICHK, and today I'm joined by Victoria Lee, our Head of English, and one of our English teachers, Mr. Richard Barnes. We'll get straight into the questions. Uh, and Victoria, can I start with you? Reading. Why is reading in teen, especially with teenagers, so important? And what skills does it develop? Well, of course, um, the skills are many. I don't think um, that we can just pin it down to one thing, really. I think it's quite a, um, a holistic skill, and a holistic, holistically important, really. Um, so, aside from the things that we, we say all the time as English teachers, like you know, it expands your vocabulary, which of course it does, um, and it embeds complex sentence structures and, and, and you know, the, the types of um, basic English skills. Um, really core um, things that it does in terms of developing the emotional side of our students, the emotional side of teenagers. Um, yeah. Emphasize with other yeah. human beings, which is really, really important, especially if they are encountering um, texts that perhaps don't actually cross their normal threshold of experience. Mm. I think it really broadens their horizons and, and develops those skills where they can um, relate to other human beings, which is yeah. something that we're really trying to do um, in general with all the other things that we do that feed into um, our core curriculum. Um, we've got creativity, we've got the ability to articulate critical um, thinking is also really important as, as our students move up the school and they'll be moving in the direction of hopefully the, the IGCSE and the IB course. Yes. Um, things like TOK and being widely read is so important in, in those areas. Sure. sure, thanks Victoria. Richard, what do you see as sort of the skills? Why, why do you want to see kids reading? Well, I guess to build on what Victoria said, you've got your obvious academic benefits, but beyond that, it sort of brings the students out of their bubble, if you like, of wherever their, their Hong Kong life, wherever it may be. Um, and it gets them to put themselves in, in, in another world, in another place, another time. And I think the most, the thing that I also noted um, was about empathy skills. Yeah. Really, reading can really develop them. Um, and that's something that beyond just the academic benefits of vocabulary building that you know to, to sympathize or to put yourself in the shoes of a character is something that i think is, is a crucial skill that reading develops i, I also you know we, i haven't mentioned which i should have you know the intrinsic enjoyment of reading mm. um, i think we take that for granted quite a lot as as people who teach books or yeah. a, um, and, and, and the um, kind of the wonderful experience of being transported somewhere else and, and you have that time to yourself um, is so um, So we mustn't overlook just the pure enjoyment factor of it as well, I think. Well, well continuing with that, uh, Victoria, do you, see, do you see sort of a connection between uh, reading and the well-being of students? Of course. I mean, I notice just to speak from personal experience, I notice it in myself. When I am in the habit, of reading every single day. Mm. Um, I notice that I have um, the ability to unwind, to sleep better, and I think our students could really benefit from that. It's switching yeah. their screens, um, you know, putting their minds in a different place, really. And I, and I think change is often really, really important, isn't it, for, for, for student well-being. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so given these benefits, Richard, I mean, do you see, do you have you seen in your career a decline in reading amongst teenagers? Victoria mentioned screens. Is, do, do you see any evidence of, of a decline? I wouldn't say there's been a decline in, 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 in the time that I've been teaching. I would say that there is a drop off from primary school during key stage three. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, there are reasons for that. Uh, screens are one of them, but I, I think also that there are other things at play as well, like 
for, for example, when students come to secondary school, um, maybe at primary school, they have a really big focus on literacy and numeracy. Mm -hmm. And then maybe there's a feeling like, well, this student can, can basically read. Mm. So there's less discussion or less focus on reading mm. because it's like, well, you know, you've ticked that box, like learning to swim, right? You've ticked that box, you can read. Mm -hmm. So we'll focus on building your writing skills or we'll read extracts, but not necessarily um, have those like daily discussions yeah. about reading. And I think reading that's also, I think when talking about screens, I think adults are as, as guilty as, as, as students. I find myself on my phone or iPad or whatever in times that I've sort of set aside for myself to read and I'm like, oh, I'll just check some news and then it's, it's really distracting. So I, I do understand that. And, and maybe perhaps there's a sense of a little bit if te teenage rebelliousness, I guess, if, if someone is told all the time, I'll read, you know, you must read, you must read, then maybe there's an element of rejecting reading in those ages or at that age, because it's a way of like asserting your um, independence, like, oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something else instead. I think there's an element of that, not in every single student, but certainly there was a drop off. I sure. think yeah. I'm a teenager, I think that's what I found. Um, as Richard said, in, in primary school, you know, there are programs where they take a book from a box every day and that's an expectation. Mm. Um, I think in secondary school, the children that have this innate interest in reading do not stop. There isn't a drop off there. Right. I mean, I've got students now who I've known you know, for seven years at ICHK who've been avid readers all the way through and, and they will come to me after class and they will discuss what they're reading and, and maybe they'll, you know, they're now in IB and they'll, they'll borrow a book or, or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and those students will just keep reading and they will be lifelong readers um, mm -hmm. because they already have that excitement about, about text. It's the students, I think, that, um, as Richard said, come to secondary school and maybe their focus is elsewhere now. Um, mm -hmm. It's not built in necessarily to the fabric of the school day. And I think that's possibly what, what teachers and parents need to kind of work together to address, probably. Yeah. Sure. If sure. I may add something, what, what I would also say is that there are obviously books that are aimed at, let's say, the 11 to 14 age range. But mm -hmm. with literature, emotional maturity is, is really important. So it might be that you have a year seven student that is a very able reader and could read a, a complex book and actually understand it. But mm -hmm. the, 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 on the deeper level, the, the, the themes might completely bypass them. Yes. So yeah. it's quite, it, it's, I guess it's our job as English teachers to try and find those books that are engaging so they can maybe move beyond um like diary of a wimpy kid let's say mm. they can move beyond that but we're not suddenly exposing them to all kinds of things which, which we haven't discussed in class which they haven't got the emotional maturity to to cope with i completely yeah. agree with that i mean i've had um discussions with parents where they where they ask you things like can you give me a list of um british classics from the 18th century yes um, and i don't think that, that that is uh, necessarily the way forward. Now, if you're going to include a classic as part of a diverse range of reading, then I think that's, you know, that's healthy, isn't it? To get a team for a range of texts. But I think considering and, and evaluating someone's reading skills being good or worthwhile based on, you know, the number of classic texts that they have been forced to wade through, I, I don't think that's necessarily, um, a long-term plan for um, engaging our teenage students. Mm. So, so, I mean, you mentioned, you know, sort of a broad reading program. How do, you know, what do we do here at ICHK, uh, Victoria, to, this, to encourage positive reading habits? Okay, so I, there are a number of um, things we do. Um, the the year 7, 8, and 9 um, English syllabus. Yes. Syllabus, um, harnesses kind of a range of texts and, and gradually builds up. So, so kind of feeding into what Richard said about emotional maturity and in year seven we text as a fellow opens our students' eyes to a wider kind of genre, I think. Um, but as they move through they maybe encounter more complex texts. So by year nine they might be um, reading Lord of the Flies or yeah. of Mice and Men. Um, mm. it's quite gritty, um, I suppose, themes. Yes, yeah. 
but, but, but certainly ones that they can begin to engage with on a far more conceptual level. So, so we try very hard to kind of build that up. Mm. Um, and then of course with GCSE, we are a little bit restricted in terms of, you know, set texts, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Um, but we do our best to um, engage with a, a wider range of um, reading sources as possible. And I think, you know, the world literature and the, the IB program help with that. Um, yeah. In terms of uh, beyond set texts, um, we have a library program for year seven and eight. Um, and I, I guess the goal of that is to encourage the students to read from as broad a range of genres uh, as they can. Mm -hmm. um, so we've made it a little bit more structured. Mm -hmm. so they should be from at least eight set genres in the year. Yeah. Um, because for the ones that will do it, they will do it anyway. The ones yeah. that are a little bit more reluctant, it gives them a manager, like a smart target, really. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, you know, we're, we're, we're always trying to build on that. Not every student manages, that's fine. But I think it's the, the intention. Absolutely. Yeah, and just, just, yeah, just starting to build those habits. Richard, what sort of conversations do you have with your students uh, in, the, in, the, in the classroom to, to, to build positive reading habits and encouraging reading? Yeah, well, for me, I obviously recommend lo lots of books. I have some, like, uh, series in mind that I always recommend, such as Harry Potter, Northern Lights, um, Rick Riordan, the Percy Jackson, the Lightning Thief series. Mm. Uh, and I try and like guide students towards these books because I think initially with with, with series, um, it obviously helps that once you've read the first one, then the, the second one is is there for you, and you can go mm. on and on and on. And a lot of them build up in terms of difficulty as well. So, especially like Harry Potter, for example, starts off pretty straightforward and ends with a like six hundred page book. Mm. Um, and also, I guess what we try and do is get them to have conversations with each other. So it's not just me or the teacher, let's say, saying these are good books. It's actually them recommending books to each other. So for example, right now with year seven, they're writing, doing like an independent reading unit. Yes. And they are doing book presentations and book reviews. And hopefully the idea is that out of that, they might see some of the presentations, they might read some of the reviews, hopefully. And then they go, and actually, that sounds like I would enjoy that. Or actually, my friend has read that and they liked it. I like the same things. Maybe I will read that. So I think we try and create those like networks where they, not, yeah, not, not just receiving information from the teacher, but also from each other, because they are obviously really up to date, a lot of them, in terms of what's just been released, the book that they've got. Whereas for me, I, I, I keep myself up to date, but I might not be right on top of it like they are. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks for that, Richard. Um, in addition, Victoria, in addition to the work that's being done within the school to support positive reading habits and daily reading habits, what can parents do? What would your advice be to parents? You mentioned a list of 18th century English classics earlier. I, I think don't give your <laughs> children lists of 18th century British classics. I think so. that would be my first practical tip. Um, for me, um, and, I, and I've seen this work, um, I think modeling being a reader is really, really important and having books around your home yeah. um, and, and having your children from all ages, from, you know, from, from their babies to slightly more um, adult children. Um, I think them seeing you reading, whether it be on a holiday, whether it be on a, you know, a, a Sunday morning or, or whatever, um, demonstrating the kids are really important. And also, um, I would really encourage to take them to bookshops and to sell them. Mm. Um, because I think that really brings, brings it to life. Let them choose. Yeah, let them choose. Exactly. It's really tactile experience. Yeah. Uh, and, and you can definitely see the benefits of mm. hospitals and things like that, um, especially if you're, if you're traveling. Um, but I think enjoying the sensory aspect of reading is really important as well. Um, so I I would definitely recommend, you know, you, you accompanying them to a good bookshop um, and, you know, letting them browse and, and choose and have some agency over the kind of text they're reading. Now, obviously, there are moments when, when parents do need to step in and, and stop um, a, a child picking up something inappropriate. Mm. Um, but 
in my experience, you know, that, that doesn't come up particularly. No. Yeah, no, that's right. So, so when you talk about sort of daily habits, is there a particular goal or is it a particular sort of period of time daily that, that, that students could be think that students and parents could be thinking about in terms of reading? I mean, I, I think bedtime is perfect. Mm -hmm. um, I think 20 minutes of reading before you turn your lights off is so beneficial. Mm -hmm. kind, um, it, it, it calms, it, it's soothed by the process and, and you are ready to sleep then. Yeah. So the benefits of reading actually Yes. You know, multiple benefits aren't there that's fantastic Richard I mean what, what what's your perspective on on how parents can can strengthen their children's re reading habits well I agree with what Victoria said about the the benefits of visiting bookshops I think that's really important to like basically just connect reading with positive things like a day out going to go and choose a book and and and, and that like tactile experience rather than just searching on Amazon or, or wherever you look for your books. Yeah. Um, I think that's beneficial. And creating, especially initially, um, and especially if you have, uh, if we have like a, a reluctant reader, let's say, mm -hmm. creating habits. So you have a time, it might be before bed, it might be a time, you know, during the day, but where that is reading time. So mm -hmm. devices go away or out of sight, and that's time for reading. Mm. And there may be some initial resistance to that, but actually I'm sure that once it becomes ingrained as a habit, then actually it becomes something that is just, you know, something to be looked forward to. And, and again, having positive conversations about books, about books that you know, like parents read when they were teenagers, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's all useful. Just connecting everything positively is, is the main thing, the main message that I would say. I do think you can also make reading into quality time as well. I think that we forget that everybody loves being read to. Mm, absolutely. What age you are. So reading a page each and going through the book is really, really nice. It is. It's a really connecting experience as well. Yeah, I think for me, that was one of my revelations when I became a teacher that I thought sort of reading aloud to year 11 there would be some kind of riot because they'd just find it really patronizing. Mm. But actually, yeah. dead silent. <laughs> they love it. Yeah. Silent, absolutely <laughs> absorbed yeah. the whole chapter. I do it with my um, year 10s with the set text where we read, I will read half and then they will read some. Mm. But yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's, and I think that's the success of, of things like Audible and other like, because people love just having a, an engaging voice reading to them. Yeah. Absolutely. So, okay. So, so fantastic. We're going to, yeah, we're going to wrap up here. Uh, and I'd like to finish with, with, with all of this taken as a whole. Mm -hmm. Can each of you please share one practical tip to develop a love of reading uh, that, would, that we can, that we can share with our community? And Victoria, can we start with you? One practical tip. Okay. So this is very specific for maybe the longest summer holidays. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that um, our teenage students should be trying to read something from a different genre at least every two weeks. Interesting. Why a different genre every two weeks? Because, well, two weeks is just a, a manageable time frame. Um, because I think in order to know what you love, you've got to try different things. Mm. It may well be that it opens up a pathway to a type of literature that, that, that the student didn't know that they loved. Mm. Um, and, and they may get hooked on something. And I think given the amount of time that they have over the summer, I think that's very, very reasonable. Mm. No, no, absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you, Victoria. Richard, what are your thoughts around what's one practical tip that you would offer parents uh, to help I've, their teenagers with reading? Uh, my practical tip is that when, when choosing a book to read the blurb on the back, because I think too often, I mean, it's a cliche to judge a book by its cover, but too often I see in, uh, let's say when we have library lessons, yes. or even someone that's gone out and, and bought a book or the parents have bought a book, and you know, it might look beautiful, shiny, but then they read the first chapter and it's 
just they're like, oh no i don't like this mm -hmm. I don't, well did you know what it was about because you know that there's a summary on the back which tells mm -hmm. you and oh no i don't know i didn't know it was about love i no, I absolutely no idea so i would just recommend um reading the blurb taking your time to choose the book because then it gives you such a better chance of being able to to get through it mm. um and to, and to read something that you that you enjoy wh whichever genre that is yeah fantastic thank you both uh, for that wonderful information about reading it's um, uh, really helpful uh, and we really appreciate your time uh, and to our community, thank you so much for joining us. And please don't hesitate to contact uh, any of us here at ICHK if there's ever anything we can do to help you, your family, and your teenage children with their reading habits. Thanks very much.